What I want to do today is basically build on um, cleaning algebra to show you um, a language that was developed uh, in the last five, six years uh, to do verification for networks. Um, and I'll mention some further extensions at the end, but I want to focus today's lecture on, on, on this language called NetCat. <clears throat> so the sort of, um, the first thing we need, um, we have cleaning algebra and cleaning algebra has um, a series of constructs that are useful to talk about traces in a program. So we've seen that you have a sequential composition of traces and you have a plus and you can do all kinds of things related to the flow. One thing cleaning algebra doesn't have built in um, as default is a way to talk about uh, control flow based on tests. So, um, you know, if you start from a very simple imperative language, you will have things like um, if then else and, and while loops. Now, it was uh, understood very quickly after um, Cozen started looking at cleaning algebra as a verification framework in the early 90s, that actually uh, a small change on the definition of cleaning algebra could lead to um, a simple language with similar properties to reason about imperative programs. So in particular, um, remember cleaning algebra is built over an alphabet. Let's call that alphabet A, or perhaps let's use sigma. Um, and so this alphabet in cleaning algebra um, is used to, to talk about the actions on your traces. So what Cozen and, and his students um, identified is that if you are willing to take this alphabet sigma, let's draw it as a square, and you are willing to sort of carve out a part of sigma, let's call this B, uh, to talk about tests, actually let's call it T, to talk about tests, then you can model um, basic imperative constructs. So let's imagine we have here, um, so we have sigma, which perhaps has actions P and Q. And then we have this part of sigma that we're gonna use to talk about tests. And we're gonna call these tests A, B, C. And what we're gonna do on these tests, because we want them to actually represent Boolean tests, we're gonna allow these tests to also um, be combined using things like not A or A or B or A and B. And so if maybe some of you have seen this, but this is basically the um, free Boolean algebra generated from a finite set of tests T. Now, if I, if I do this, so if I say, okay, take your alphabet, over which you're building your cleaning algebra, carve out part of that alphabet to talk about tests or simply take another alphabet, that would be another option. Um, then you can actually encode, let's look at the, um, at the conditional, at the if then else. What does if then else actually means in terms of traces? Well, there's a Boolean test that guards whether the then branch or the else branch executes. So if B is true, then definitely P will execute. Uh, whereas if P is false, then Q will execute. So let's denote that with a green and a red um, arrow. So one can think about the traces that this program generates and actually realize that they are the same traces as this regular expression. So you observe the fact that B is true and then you see action P or you observe the fact that not B is true and then you continue with action Q. Similarly for uh, while loops, what you do, what is a while loop? Well, a while loop is executing P as many times as B is true. And then at some point, not B is true and you exit the loop. So that's what this regular expression here on the side is saying. So it's saying, okay, 
you use the star to basically say, I'm gonna execute P as long as B is true. And at some point I'm gonna jump out of that and I'm gonna observe a not P. So if I've managed to jump out of the loop is because not P um, is true, okay? So at this point, what have we done here? We've actually encoded all these imperative programs as regular expressions. So now all the toolkit from regular expressions is available to reason about imperative programs. And back on my very first lecture, my very first slide, I actually put, put up some imperative programs and their equivalence as a verification question. So are two um, simple imperative programs equivalent? Perhaps one is a, an optimization of the other. And that question can now be answered by using all the tools we looked at from regular expressions because we have this encoding. Now, this can be done more formally and that's what um, Cozen and, and his students did. Um, and so they, this is where Clean Also with Tests or CAT comes from. For those of you who saw the video advertising my lecture with the CAT, uh, this is where the cat is coming from. Um, so a cat or a clean algebra with tests is pretty much what I described in previous slides. So instead of having just a clean algebra, so you have a clean algebra like before, but now you have a Boolean algebra, which is embedded in the clean algebra. So this is the thing I schematically drew in the previous slide with requesting that the alphabets that you're building things from are uh, part of each other. And what does this mean as well? The fact that the Boolean algebra is embedded into the Kleene algebra is that the ands and the or of the Boolean algebra can simply be interpreted as the sequential composition and the plus of the Kleene algebra. So you're sort of reusing the symbols, but you interpret, it, you interpret them differently. So for instance, uh, for instance, we have in clean algebra that uh, P plus P is P. So when I have this axiom over tests, so let's, let's call the test P. So that's, that's still true. And that is true because in Boolean algebra, B or B is B. There's a few additional axioms from uh, Boolean algebra that uh, Kleene algebra will inherit because for instance, I also have in Boolean algebra that B or not B is um, one. So that will translate to B plus not B is one. I also have that uh, B and zero is zero and so that happens to already be a Kleene algebra axiom because B sequential composed with zero is just zero. Okay, so you have, you sort of identify the symbols and all the axioms that were valid for Kleene algebra are valid axioms of Boolean algebra. So that's, that's cool. So you just inherit those. And then there's a few more about the uh, complement of a test um, that you, um, you have from uh, Boolean algebra. And you might ask yourself, um, what is the free model of CAT? So before, remember we had for Kleene algebra only, we had regular languages. And for CAT, um, things are a little bit uh, different. So you also have strings, you have regular sets of strings, but those regular sets of strings look a bit different. So in particular, they look like this. They have actions. So these actions here are from the Kleene algebra. So they are actions in Sigma. And then the strings are guarded. So these are actually called guarded strings. The strings are guarded by um, this uh, tests alpha, beta, gamma, which are so-called complete tests or atoms of the Boolean algebra. 
And these are really um, the minimal elements of your Boolean algebra. Or if you want, very practically, if your um, alphabet T of tests has N elements, then a complete test is nothing else than all the variables T1 to Tn. And each of them, you need to decide whether it's a true or false. And if it's false, you just add um, the not over it. So you have a complete assignment of all your tests. And those are the minimal, the minimal elements of your, of your Boolean algebra. And so if you think a little bit about this uh, from a programming point of view, what does this say? It says a trace of an imperative program will be always, every time you see an action, you might be changing the value of your variables. And so you have the state of your variables, alpha, you see action P, and then you might end up with a different state of your variables, that's beta, and then you see action Q, and then after action Q, you might see another state of your variables. So these alpha, beta, gammas are capturing snapshots of the variables, the Boolean variables you use in the uh, conditionals and in the wild programs, uh, in the guards of the wild programs that, that you're building, okay? But again, uh, the construction of this free model and showing that this is exactly the right semantics could also be done um, using a uh, category theory argument, which I will not make now to avoid that, uh, that we, lose, uh, we lose connection. I might do it at the end if I have time, but I, I really wanna get to netcat. So, um, so I'll skip that for a moment. I'll just mention a couple of uh, facts about cat. For those of you who know about Hoare logic, cat actually subsumes propositional Hoare logic so the validity of a Hoare triple, so the way you should read this Hoare triple, P is a program, an imperative program, and you have a um, precondition of this program and then a postcondition. And so you say, under precondition B, my program P executes, and at the end, my postcondition C holds. And basically checking the validity of, um, of this Hoare triple is equivalent to checking the equivalence of any of these uh, three things really. Um, so you, you basically are reducing validity of Hoare triples to equivalence of two uh, regular expressions. And um, here's for instance, what happens to the while when P is the while, the while um, program but this is not uh, super important. I just wanted to uh, mention it as a fact about CAT. Uh, CAT has been studied um, extensively like linear algebra and uh, most of the results you've seen for linear algebra uh, lift to CAT. So as I mentioned, this subsumes propositional Hoare logic, but it, it also has like linear algebra, several models, including a relational model and it has a language model that I've already mentioned. And then it has different flavors of trace models. Uh, equivalence in clinical algebra tests is also decidable and it's decidable in P space. And it can be um, one of the procedures to decide equivalence is using an automaton that looks very much like deterministic automata, except that the um, states, instead of being final and non-final, output the tests that are true at the moment of exit. And so these are uh, called guarded automata and um, have been introduced about 20 years ago. Um, all these references will actually be in the readme file that I will, um, I will upload later today uh, when I finish the lectures together with the slides. So you, if you're curious about more results on CAT, there will be some references there that you can take a look at. Um, CAT has been applied to um, protocol verification and static analysis of, of programs and also on compiler optimizations and, and other things. Okay, so now we get to the, to the thing I, I really wanted to show you. Um, and this is a, a language called Netcat. Here on the left, you see Carbon, the original Netcat. And on the right, you see um, Neko, who is uh, the uh, Mac Netcat, uh, which is another tool we have on, on Netcat. So we have all kinds of, of cats um, involved in this project. 
And um, the sort of context of, of this project, NETCAT, which is led by Nate Foster at um, Cornell, is that um, since the appearance of, of this new paradigm so called software defined networks, there's been a lot of work on formal, spe formal specification and verification. And you will see there's, there's a bunch of, there's a list of languages actually here on the slide um, that appeared all the way from 2010, 2011. Um, and there's many more things that came after this paper that I, I'm going to be talking about from 2014. Um, so there's a lot of work still still going on, including uh, work in my in my group on concurrency. Um, and this this is sort of all these works follow um, a pattern that is quite common in in programming languages work, um, which is. You design, so you have this low level system, which is a network that you want to describe and you want to verify properties of. And so the way a lot of these projects went about this problem was to say, okay, let's design a high level language that can model all the essential features I want to talk about from this network. Let's then develop a semantics for the language that actually allows me to reason about the behavior because I need the semantics to talk about what the program does. And then on top of that, let's build tools that actually allow us to synthesize these low level implementations that are uh, perhaps correct by construction because I've verified them. Uh, so there's this sort of three step uh, research program, if you like, that a lot of these projects uh, followed and, and NetCat is fits into this um, into this pattern. So what I will show you is the first two steps. Um, but there's again, there's a lot of material out there um, on the third step as well. So what is NetCat? So the idea behind NetCat. So as I said, you sort of want to model the basic entities um, in a network. And when NetCat was designed. Sort of the main goal uh, was to talk about properties like reachability in a network. So how do you talk about reachability in the network? So think abstractly about a network being a collection of boxes that are connected by you know, different links. And what happens in this network? Well, you have little packets coming in they come in and they sort of travel around the network depending on what each of these boxes lets the packet do or, or wants the packet to do. And so that's what the sort of behavior that NetCat wanted to describe. And you start seeing the, the sort of flavor that we already have from Clinical Algebra, right? So you have these packets, which are some entities and they are traversing a network. So what you're doing, you're sort of capturing paths so you're capturing traces. And it is this idea that in the end of the day, these network programs are not that different from traces in a regular expression or traces in an imperative program. What else do they have? Well, they have packets. So that's a slightly different thing. And so that's the thing that NetCat sort of captures. So NetCat is really a cat in, way, in which the tests and the actions have a very specific shape. So here's the basic setup. So NetCat assumes that there is um, a packet, pi, and this packet is basically a finite record. So think of it as a finite record that has some, you know, some fields, let's say it has a field, um, for which switch it is in, maybe it has which port it came in and so on. So it has a bunch of fields and each of these fields comes with a value, maybe a natural number. And these we assume to be finite. So the number of fields and the number of values is finite. And the, the sort of traces along the network are going to be these things that they call packet histories. So packet histories are nothing else than strings of packets. So you have a packet and then you have next packet and so on. And these are supposed to capture the life of a packet traversing the network. And um, in the semantics, sometimes I, I talk about the head packet, which is just the first packet on top of the history. So in, in some sense, when you have a history with all the packets, 
you think of the head packet as the packet that you're sort of manipulating right now. And the rest is just history. So you're sort of not accessing it. You're just keeping it. So here's what the actions in Netcat look like. So we have assignments of the sort X goes to N. So X is um, a field name and N is a value. We can do tests and tests again are pairs that test if a certain field has a certain value. And then there's this special action called dupe which will allow you to record or du duplicate your current state, your current packet, okay? So think of, of so Netcat is really, is a clean algebra with tests in which the tests are pairs and the actions are also pairs. And they are pairs over this alphabet of field names and field values. So here's your first Netcat program. So this program here um, says for all packets that are at switch six on port eight, what you do, and I should have actually used this symbol here. Billy, is there someone asking questions? Uh, no, not right now. And just so you know, you okay. haven't blinked out at all. Okay, I, I thought I heard the mic going unmuted, that's why I asked. Um, so for all packets located at port eight of uh, switch six, you just change the destination address to be this value and you send the packet out on port five, okay? So this is the first example of a program you can write with these tests and actions. You can then take an entire network, you know, formed of links and, and some switches that are doing something, and you can actually uh, encode each of these components in a network program that looks very much like the one I showed in the previous slide. And I will, I will show this in detail in the next slides. But once you have um, programs for each of these boxes, and you also have programs for the topology, then what the whole network does is the following. It either is executing, is sort of flushing the packets that are inside the boxes, the gray boxes. So it's executing the policy of the switches, or it might be executing the policy, sending them through the links. So through the topology and then back to processing them inside the switches or it's doing this two times, or it's doing this three times, four times, n times. So in fact, a, the program that captures the multi-step behavior of the network is a regular expression that looks like this. So you have a program to denote what's going on inside the boxes. You have a program to denote what's going on in the links that connect these boxes. You execute that as many times as you want or as, as many times as you perhaps have packets. And then at the end, you do an extra step of uh, flushing anything you might have in the switches. Okay, so let's look at this in more detail. I mean, this is sort of an abstract view of what the whole network does. But before we do that, let's look at um, the axioms that hold for Netcat. So all the axioms of clean algebra hold. So we still have plus is associative and commutative and idempotent. We have the uh, sequential composition is associative and so on. But we have some extra things that reflect what packets are about. And in fact, uh, we have about eight extra axioms and they are very similar. Um, if you've seen the axioms of global variables, they are actually quite similar because what do we have? Well, if you are assigning a value to a field and then you assign a different value to a different field, then you can swap these things. And here, remember that in, in KA, for arbitrary P and Q, this is not true. So sequential composition is not commutative. And what this axiom is saying is actually in Netcat for some specific type of actions, we are gonna allow them to commute. So that's the first one. The second one is saying, 
if I've assigned a value to X and at the same time I am testing in a different field that the value is M, again, I can swap them because I, basically the principle of these two axioms is that you have your packet and these are different. So if this is X and this is Y, these are different zones of your memory, of your local memory. If you think of the packet as your local memory. So you're sort of accessing different zones, either to test or to do an assignment. And therefore, since they are different zones, you can swap any actions on them. Then the third one is about the special action dupe. And basically it says, look, if you know that field X has value N, and then you sort of duplicated that knowledge, then that's the same thing as first you duplicate it and then you actually know that um, your field still has N. So this is saying that when you duplicate your packet, you preserve the values of your fields. You're not sort of corrupting your packet as you duplicate it. Then the fourth one is saying that testing that the field has value N after I've just changed it to be N is a useless test because I've just changed it to be N. So it has to be N. And dually, if I already know that the packet has value N, I don't need to reassign it value N because I've just told you it has value N. So again, it's a useless action. And the uh, one but last line basically says, if I've overwritten an, an action, a value that I've put in a, in a field, then only the last value survives. So if I've assigned N to X and then I've assigned M to X, the N is gone. I will never be able to recover the fact that an N was there. The last line um, says that you cannot have different values inside a field. So if you test the field to be N and if you test the field to be M, then that must be false because if N and M are different values. Um, and this axiom here on the side is saying, I have something inside X. So this is basically requiring that your packets are initialized. So you can't have an unknown value in a field. It must have something. And that's sort of, a, um, you know, something that is desirable for the algebraic theory that you don't have um, empty fields. Okay, so these are the extra axioms that uh, for Netcat. And how, um, how does it work in terms of the semantics? So the standard model of a Netcat program is saying that if I take a packet history, my program is going to transform it into a set of packet histories. In particular, let's look at the basic actions and tests. If I assign a value n to a field x and I'm looking at packet pi one, so the head packet is pi one, then pi one gets changed to have value n in field x and the rest of the history remains unchanged. If I'm testing if um, a field has value n, then one of two things happens. The packet, the head packet indeed passes the test and so I keep the history or the head packet does not pass the test and then I drop that history completely, I forget about it. And the dupe action just duplicates the head packet. So it basically freezes the state of the head packet right now. And using this, uh, sorry, I should have said um, in the previous slide that um, the semantics of, the semantics of uh, plus continues to be union like before and the semantics of sequential composition um, is, yeah, maybe I should, sorry, maybe I should just write these definitions. It's the same, but slightly different. So if I have P plus Q, and I'm applying this to a history like this, then I just take the union. I just take the union, apply to the same thing. If I have 
a sequential composition, then what do I do? Well, first of all, I need to apply P. So I'm reading my sequential composition from uh, left to right. So I first apply P to pi one. And this, this will generate a set like that. So then for each element of the set that I generate here, I'm going to apply Q. So this is a set of histories. So I'm going to apply Q. So I'm going to apply Q. I'm going to do a map of Q into all those histories. And then I get a set of set of histories. And so I'm going to take the union of all of that. Okay. So basically what you do, I mean, it's the usual definition of sequential composition. It says, I execute the first program, I get a bunch of results. And so I execute the second program on all these results. And then I take the union of those traces. Okay. Now, what can we do uh, with this language? We can start talking about certain properties. In particular, we can talk about things like reachability, which is where the one I'm going to show you very explicitly. I can encode as a property, actually as an equivalence property, can a host A in a network communicate with host B? And you can do other things. You can do some basic security properties, checking if uh, all traffic goes through a firewall. Uh, you can detect whether your program has loops um, that you didn't intend to have so that the, pro that the packet is being forwarded um, at the eternum in a loop. So let's um, look. So what I want to do for the next 10 or 15 minutes is show you how to encode every single component of the network in a netcat program and how to encode the property of reachability and how would you then verify it. And then uh, hopefully time will allow to show you some uh, more uh, complex properties. So the first thing we need to do, so you remember a few slides ago, I showed you sort of a bird's eye view of a network and you have the links in blue, you have this topology, and then you have the boxes, which are switches. And so we need to encode each of these components. So let's start with the topology. So what happens in the topology? We have two boxes, um, let's say A and B, and they are connected. So there's a link going from A to B, and this link is connected in a port. And in this case, we're taking port N and port M. So every link in your network that looks like this, you're gonna encode as this program. And what is this program saying? It's basically telling you, if I have a packet here, at the beginning of the link. So if, the, if my packet is in switch A at port N, that's where, where this red envelope is, then the fact that I have a link very much translates in sending this packet over to here. And the sending the packet over is just changing its location in the program to be port M of switch B, okay? So basically, this program here, this simple program, is only looking at packets that are at port 10 in switch A. So it sort of ignores all the other packets for a moment. And it updates the switch and port fields to make them go to the end of the link. And abstractly, this really captures the action of sending the packet, OK? So if you encode all the links in your topology like this, so let's um, call this for a second, this program, L, A, B, N, M. So if you encode all your links like that, then the whole topology of the network is a big sum. So this is the Kline algebra plus of all your links that you have. So for all A's, you know, for all A's and B's and N and M's that are valid, you take a big sum. And that's your topology. And basically the that program will will basically take care of sending any packet that is a certain port to the corresponding port that is at the end of the link. 
Okay, so this is step one. Now step two is to encode what happens inside the, the boxes, so inside the switches. And the thing about um, the switches is that if you sort of zoom in inside of the switches, you will notice that they are nothing else than little networks. So what, what can switches do? So they have inside um, these tables, they are called sometimes match action tables. And these match action tables are basically a bunch of tests um, on the fields of the packets and then some action. For instance, might say, oh, if a packet came from switch one, drop it. Or if a packet um, came from port three, send it out in port five. And so if you look at these tables that are actually stored inside the switches, what are they? They are basically these massive if then else programs. If this test is true, do that. If that test is true, do that. And sometimes at the end of these tables, you have a star, which is if nothing else um, matched. So if none of the tests passed, then do, then do something else. And so basically what happens is that these, these tables that are inside the switches can again be captured in exactly the same way. So for instance, here in this example, we're capturing a line in one of these tables that um, could be encoding, if this would be port N here, it would be basically encoding this multicast effect on port M and K. So it's saying, oh, my table has a line that says, if a packet comes in on port N and it happens to be destined to go to um, A, then actually switch the destination to B and multicast this packet on both port M and K. And so basically you encode all the tables inside the switches again as a big sum of programs like this. So every line becomes an if then else, and then you take a sum of all of that, okay? So now what do we have? We have a sum of all the link expressions. We have a sum of all the switch policies. And now we just put them together using the, you know, the elements of Kline algebra. So one step of the network is basically P sequentially composed with T. Each switch processes its packets and then they are sent along the links that are valid according to, to the topology. And if we want the multi-step behavior, we just basically wrap this whole thing inside the star. So we can execute everything inside the switches, sending them, send them along, and then in the next step, execute again, send them along, and so on. And now let's imagine we want to do reachability, right? So we want to check that I can travel from node A to node B. So that's the same thing as asking the following equivalence question. If I start in node A, so that's the test switches A, and I send my packet at node A somehow, according to the links, and then I execute the network one, you know, zero, one, multiple times, as many times as I want, then eventually it is true that I can validate the test switches B. So if instead I check whether this program, this whole program is equivalent to zero, so if this is true, then I know that B is not reachable from A. And if this is not true, then I know that B is reachable from A because it means I've, I've eventually seen that test uh, validate. And so basically what have we done here? We have reduced a property which is very common in networking, to a program equivalence question. And how we check this program equivalence is up to us. So we can use automata, we can use axioms, we can use whatever we want, but we can answer that question in different ways. And that's sort of the, um, the power behind this 
these languages based on, um, on Clean Algebra, is that these sort of questions that require equivalence can be answered in many different ways. And uh, you can generalize this property to all pairs reachability, checking if um, every host in the network can reach with every other host, and then you would get um, you would get some something like this, which is, looks a little bit more uh, more difficult because on one side you actually have a program which um, has a star, and you can check uh, for forwarding loops. Uh, so you can check if when you execute your network, your packet is basically just going around the same state over and over again. So you can again do a program equivalence question that should be three bars. Um, and you can check whether that program is actually hitting the same state um, over and over again. And now this, this language netcat uh, again was studied using the same tools as Clean Algebra. And you can look uh, at these papers from 14 and 15, and you will see that the axioms I've shown you before are actually complete um, for, uh, for Netcat. And there's a decision procedure based on automata, which actually uses a lot of up to techniques um, like the one we saw and uses data structures uh, based on Hopcroft and, and CARP, which we've seen um, in the second lecture. And this has been implemented in, in OCaml, and I'll just show you um, a couple of results. Uh, let me just go to a later slide so that I can show you. I can show you something cool. Um, and I, I will then show you the details. I'm showing, showing the results before showing the, the details. So there are some automata corresponding to Netcat programs. And you can develop a bi-simulation algorithm very much in the spirit of what I showed you for deterministic and non-deterministic finite automata. And you can then um, sort of test uh, whether this algorithm you know, uh, performs OK in comparison to other things that are out there. Um, and in particular, we've looked at um, some real networks and we looked at point-to-point -point reachability. So the property I've, I've just shown you that is testing whether um, a node A can reach a node B and does this by checking whether that program is equivalent to the false program. And you, in this uh, Stanford campus network, we could actually check uh, for all pairs uh, reachability in um, less than a second using this bi-simulation based algorithm, which at that time, so this was back in 2015, the best known algorithm for this was something called header space analysis. And uh, that was taking in that same network with that same configuration about 13 seconds to, to answer the same question. So here you see a little bit the, the sort two things. One, that this basic, data structures from uh, automata theory can be transported into um, verification and are actually very, very efficient. And you can, if you build your languages in sort of the right layers, then you can um, actually inherit a lot of the good properties that you had in the base language. So Netcat actually inherits a lot of the properties we knew from, from clean algebra. And this um, experiment uh, shows precisely, precisely that. Um, I'm looking at the time and deciding how much I can show you. Um, let's quickly go through the previous slides um, really very quickly. And then I wanna show you um, some other example. So, Netcat, as I said, was studied very much in the spirit of clean algebra, and it came also with a language model. So the standard model that I showed you before, which were those um, filter or history uh, transformers, um, is equivalent to a different semantics, which um, is regular subsets of um, guarded strings. And those guarded strings are basically very similar to the ones of clean algebra with tests in which you have complete assignments and complete tests um, ranging over the actions that you can do on a field and over the tests that you can do um, on a field as well. 
And so you can show a bunch of facts about this language model and about these complete assignments and complete tests. You can show that um, every test, so if I have a test x equals n, this is actually provably equivalent to a big sum of complete tests. So let's call these complete tests alpha for a second. So it's actually um, equivalent to the sum of um, a bunch of alphas. And which alphas are these? Well, these are the alphas that for the field x have x equals n. And for all the other fields, they do all the other possibilities that you can do. So basically, if I'm interested in testing that x equals n, a way of very inefficiently implement this test is to say, I test x equals n, and then for all the other fields, I have to test every single possible value. So I'm going to run this exponentially large amount of tests just for the fun of it. Um, and it's not really for the fun of it. It's to actually, these complete assignments and complete tests algebraically have nice properties. So you really want to capture that every single action is sort of belongs in a lattice of actions and these complete tests and complete assignments are sort of the minimal elements. So algebraically, they make a lot of sense. From a programming point of view, um, they look like, uh, you know, you're doing lots of useless tests just to test one, one single fact. Um, and then there's, there's this uh, version of Netcat uh, based on complete tests and complete assignments, uh, which is called reduced Netcat. Um, in which basically you don't have any more the actions x equals n or the test x equals n, but you only are, are allowed to do complete tests. So you always have to test all the fields. You always have to change all the fields. And again, from a programming point of view, this is an overkill, right? You don't always want to test all the fields. You don't always want to change all the fields. But from a semantics perspective, this is actually helpful that you assume this. And this reduced net cat is basically the pathway towards completeness. So this will be your normal form for your net cat programs. And so every net cat program in the completeness proof will be shown to be equivalent to a reduced net cat program. And once you have a reduced net cat program, you're actually very close to the proof of completeness of Kleene algebra. And you then just reuse that proof that we saw uh, yesterday. Um, and there's the language model, which are these netcat reduced strings that have atoms. So complete tests, complete actions, complete assignments, and then, and so on. So you have strings of these alternated, but I'm going to skip this slide in interest of time. Um, so then there's a completeness result that says that um, the family of regular subsets of these guarded strings um, is actually a netcat and is isomorphic to um, the standard model, which again are these functions from histories to sets of histories. And the subsets of strings are the free model of netcat on the generators of complete tests and complete assignments. And so this is what completeness looks like for netcat. So a netcat program imply, uh, sorry, the netcat axioms um, can be used to derive that two programs are the same if and only if they have the same semantics, both from the language point of view and from the um, standard model point of view. And um, the other thing that was then generalized is to have a, a special type of automaton for netcat. And these look very much like regular deterministic automata, except that the alphabet is now this complete, are pairs of complete tests. So at are these complete tests. And the function that usually says whether a state is final or non-final now outputs a set of pairs of complete tests. And again, I think I mentioned this before for cat, you can think of these complete tests as the state of your variables as you terminate your program. And so you just record that in your, in your state. And then you can define how these automata accept um, netcat strings. And um, you can talk about building these automata from expressions in the same way we, we've proved the Kleene theorem. So you can show that every netcat program 
has a corresponding automaton, and every automaton has a corresponding um, netcat uh, program. And this is done so uh, from, from expression to automata, you use a generalization of Brzozowski derivatives uh, or anti Mirov, that also would work. And from um, automata to expressions, you use um, something very similar to uh, the equation solving method that I showed um, a couple of lectures ago, the first lecture. And then if you want to check whether two expressions are the same, you can convert them to automata. And then you can check whether these automata are equivalent using um, an algorithm that looks like Hopcroft and CARP. And we use binary decision diagrams to um, represent the tests. And um, that was based on, on another paper by Damia Pus. And uh, this algorithm turns out to be very competitive with the state of the art, as I've shown you um, before. OK, sorry for rushing through this, um, these results, um, but I wanted to show you uh, another, another example of what, of what you can prove in, in NetCat. So let's look at this very simple example where you have two hosts, host one and host two, and you have two switches, and you are forwarding packets between the hosts, but you would like to block SSH packets. So you're basically doing a form of uh, access control between these hosts. So how would you do this um, using, using NetCat? OK, so first, you, we encode the forwarding. So the forwarding just says, if I'm going to H1, then move packets to port 1. And if I'm going to H2, move packets to port 2. And here, uh, it might be worth noting that I've actually reused the numbers of the ports to make it uh, to make the program a bit more compact. So if you're going from, um, you know, into host one, you can always just send out on port one, because that's going in the right direction. And if you're going to host two, you send on port two, and that's going in the right direction. So you don't need to have four names, you can just do it with two names. And then the access control policy is just basically saying, if the packet is not SSH, then execute the forwarding. If it's SSH, this policy is not saying anything, which means the packet gets dropped. And then the whole um, on switch A, this is what is going to look like. So it's going to basically say, OK, I'm going to install my access control on switch A. So if I'm on switch A, I'm going to execute the access control. And if I'm on switch B, I'm just going to forward packets. OK, so this is a, a design uh, choice. I chose to install the access control on switch A. So now the question is, with this encoding, is it true that um, SS, non-SSH packets are forwarded and SSH packets are dropped? And can we show that um, these programs uh, are actually equivalent? And sorry, I should say, because I didn't say that, um, that I would like to, so I have two versions. So I have the policy installed in switch A, and I have the policy also installed in switch B, that's PB. And so the question is, can I install it in either? And I, I get the same result. So the first thing we want to show is that indeed, we are correct, correctly forwarding packets. Namely, if I start with an SSH packet and I am in switch A in port one and I execute my uh, network, then getting to switch B on port two should, not, should never happen, right? Because I'm not supposed to forward SSH packets. And showing this property here is actually equivalent to showing this um, inequality 
that um, that shows on the second line. Now, the other thing uh, we wanted to show was that installing the access control on switch A is the same as installing on switch B. Meaning, if I have my program and I replace installing the policy on switch A or on switch B, they, I shouldn't be able to observe any difference. So let's actually look at the proof of this equivalence. Um, so the first thing we do is expand, expand um, the star and we replace PA by um, the definition. So you remember the definition of PA was that the packet is in switch A. I'm abbreviating a few things so that it fits on one line. And the type is not SSH, then I can forward it. And if I'm in B, then I just forward things. So if I take that there, note that I can now distribute, because I have a plus here, I can distribute this part inside the plus. And so that's what's happening here. So I've just distributed the T followed by the test whether the packet is SSH into um, the plus. At this point, I know that I can commute because of um, the axioms of Netcat, I can commute this test here back over P and T because P and T do not touch the test of the type of the packet. But that means I end up with testing whether a packet is SSH or not SSH, which is the same as false. So I end up being able to actually eliminate that whole thing because that's all equivalent to zero. So I'm left just with this program, ab.p.t.ssh. And now, so this is the same program, I'm continuing. I can actually continue by looking at the fact that I have a star here and I can enroll my star once. So this star here is the same as one plus the program times the star. And now that I have again this one plus here, I can distribute the right side, the left side into the plus. And I ended up with a program like this. But now I have this, again, this SSH test here, which commutes with AB. So I commute those two actions. And now I end up um, at a point where I can show that I have two incompatible tests. And this, this whole program is actually equal to zero plus zero. And that's using a side lemma, which I haven't shown you. Um, but believe me that in the same way that we, in the previous slide, managed to join an SSH with a not SSH, you can do the same here in this program and you end up with zero plus zero. And basically what you do, and it would be nice if I can show you these two slides in one. In the same way I went from this program that starts here with PA, I can then go the, the other way around from the program that starts with PB and end up in uh, zero plus zero as well. And so basically you show that these two programs are actually equivalent um, to zero and they are therefore the same. And um, sorry, let me just go back one slide. And so basically what we end up with is, um, is an equivalence question that basically tells me my access control policy can be installed in either A or B. And if you remember the setup, so this setup is a linear setup. So any packet going from here to here definitely has to hop between the two switches. So if we need to filter a certain type of packet, it is natural to say, I can either filter it here or filter it here. So what we've done is show that property, which is intuitively obviously true, 
using program equivalence. And I've shown you a proof with the axioms uh, just for, you know, to show you that this is possible. Um, but obviously the sort of more implementable proof would be just using um, the automata based procedure. And then you can do this um, relatively efficiently. Okay, so um, I hope that you got a flavor for what you can do with Netcat. So Netcat um, is this high level language to reason about network behavior in, in SDNs. And it's based on linear algebra, so it has this core of, um, of sound mathematical principles and it has a formal denotational semantics and um, by simulation based procedures. And there's loads of applications um, that you can use Netcat for and it, Netcat has been used for. And uh, there's a compiler, you can compile Netcat down to OpenFlow, which is this low level language for SDNs. There's a whole project now on a, on a language called P4 that is widely used um, and P4 programs are, are not um, that far. Some P4 programs are not that far from, from Netcat. And the fact that we have this uh, compositional semantics that we inherit from linear algebra actually plays a key role in the scalability of, of the use of Netcat. And now I'll, I'll finish my um, lecture with um, a comment about um, what, I, well, what I call the cat tower principle. Um, really, if I had been careful, this tower would have KA here. Um, so the work I showed you today on NetCat and CAT is built on top of Clean Algebra in a very sort of, you know, there's a list of wishes when you're building these languages. In particular, you want that everything you add on top of Clean Algebra does not break the nice properties of Clean Algebra. So Clean Algebra has a you know, complete deductive system. It has um, nice equivalence uh, algorithms based on automata. And so when you're building languages on top of it, you wanna inherit that because that's sort of nice for verification. On the other hand, you want these languages to be usable. So Netcat, um, was good for reachability and for properties that look very much like reachability or, or access control. Um, we've done work after Netcat on properties that are um, more uh, quantitative and we've looked at properties like congestion in a network. And for that, we needed to extend the language with some form of quantity and we've chosen to extend it the language with a probabilistic choice and so that gave rise to um, a language we call prop netcat. And uh, in the last couple of years, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, how to extend um, these languages with concurrency. And so a lot of, the, of what happens in a network um, involves some form of concurrency. So in particular, I kind of sneaked one of the assumptions uh, under the carpet when I was explaining you netcat, um, which is the fact that in, in netcat and its semantics, there's this sort of hidden assumption that you have one packet at every moment, and that's the one packet you're looking at. But the reality for reachability, that's absolutely fine assumption, but the reality is for other behaviors, you can't assume you have one packet in your network you have multiple packets and they are traveling through the network and they might actually influence other packets that they don't clash with, but that they happen to, you know, change the value of a variable that then that other packet goes and tests. And that sort of multiple packet behavior, which, is, you know, which brings some form of concurrent threads uh, to the picture is not so easy to capture algebraically. Um, so I, I've spent, um, quite some time thinking about this with some of my students. And uh, we now have uh, a version of, of Netcat that has concurrency and multiple packets. And again, you know, these things are built as layers on top of each other. And because of the wish of keeping these layers conservative, you have to be very careful on how you put them together. Um, and so, you know, just as a summary, Linear algebra allows you to talk about patterns and paths, and then linear algebra with tests gives you the extension to talk about simple imperative programs, so programs where you have control flow, uh, you have if-then-else and while loops. 
Then you have NetCat, which allows you to talk about reachability in, in a network and allows you to talk about changing a local state in the form of, of a packet. You have PropNetCat, which allows you to talk about properties like congestion and random forwarding um, inside the network. And all these extensions have this uh, wish to be conservative. So you want to have the semantics and the algorithms that you inherit from Clean Algebra. You want to preserve those as much as you can. And this is not um, a trivial thing that you get them for free, but you work hard to make sure that your extensions are, are compatible. Um, and you want to have a compositional semantics like you like one did in, in Clean Algebra. Because ultimately, compositional semantics is the basis of um, scalable verification. So the fact that you can verify your properties in fragments of your program and then combine those um, results together is, um, is very important. And so this is the end. Um, so my cat tower is the end of my, uh, of my lectures. And uh, I hope you guys got a glimpse in this last lecture of all the things you can build on top of Clean Algebra to do some uh, more expressive and cool uh, verification in different in different contexts and in particular um, in networks. And I'm happy to take uh, questions for the remaining few minutes we have. And uh, I will then upload a summary and all the slides into into Slack. Can people unmute at this point or should I read out some questions? Uh, to start with, Prasanth has asked what uh, exactly it means to keep a layer of the um, tower conservative, which you said preserves, some, um, well, I guess uh, precisely what you're interested in preserving. Yeah, so what I want when I have these extensions, I want that if I have a program that doesn't use constructs from the extensions, their semantics should coincide with the previous layer. So let's imagine I add probabilities to my netcat program, right? But then in that probabilistic uh, language, I write a program without probabilities. When I compute the semantics of that, that semantics should be exactly the same as netcat. Because otherwise I did something in my extension that is changing the behavior uh, of the base language. That's what I meant by conservative. There was another question that was somewhat asked and answered in the chat earlier, but uh, there is just a question about how um, how exactly network topology is represented if programs act directly on fields of the packet. Right. So you think of each link as a program that indeed acts on fields and basically changes the location of that packet from being on the port on one side of the link to the port on the other side of the link. And that's how topology, and you know, I'll put it between quotes because indeed you're sort of capturing the link as a virtual program that moves packet from location A to location B instantaneously. And this does not account for things like the physical link is down, right? I mean, it doesn't say anything about the physical link. It's just sort of think of it as a virtual link between uh, between the two the two switches. Uh, next is a question. Uh, how, are there any negative results about how far you could build this tower? Like uh, presumably, eventually you reach a point where you can't model everything you're interested in while using Clean Algebra yeah. as your base. Yeah. Uh, so the concurrent um, layer um, is one where where there are some negative results and. Um, We've been working on it for about two and a half years now, and we're we're sort of getting to a point where we understand what is negative and what is positive, uh, and we can write down these things. But basically, once you add probabilities and concurrency, um, even separately, so you start hitting uh, negative results very quickly. So for instance, with probabilities, you can write a program that um, generates a continuous distribution very easily. You can write a very simple uh, star program that generates a distribution that uh, you can handle uh, very well when you're doing verification. And so what you want to do, so you have these programs and they happen to be extremely expressive. 
And that's bad for verification because then you, you end up in a space of behaviors that you can't efficiently prove properties about. So what you end up doing is sort of saying, okay, I can live with the fact that the semantics gives rise to all these probability distributions I don't know how to handle very well, but I can characterize the fragment of programs that remains inside some well-behaved probability distributions, which I can approximate the result of. And the same thing for concurrency. I mean, once you hit concurrency, you start hitting questions like, what is your memory model? Are you assuming that your programs are sequentially consistent? How do you access the global store? What sort of assumptions do you make on the global store? And so these start, you know, you start hitting details that are much less algebraic than what you have in the lower layers. So the lower layers, because they abstract so many things away, they are purely algebraic. Whereas when you start hitting the probabilistic and the concurrent layer, there will be things you cannot do in the verification side of things. And the semantics will, will become less um, decidable, less regular, if you like. Uh, there's uh, someone's asked if there's an extension of this that deals with state, for instance, a switch in a network that might have a counter. Yeah, so the concurrent, um, the concurrent version um, is actually extending at the same time with parallel threads and the state. And there is also um, a version just with state, which is in a um, PhD thesis of a student of Dexter that is coming out this year. I don't know if any of, if that is already uh, published, but there is also a version with, with state that is upcoming, let's say. Um, but the concurrent version, which um, will be on archive in, in a couple of weeks, uh, has both uh, state and concurrency, because in some sense, in order to have real concurrency, you end up finding yourself needing a global state. And uh, last one for now, um, does it make sense to just impose probability on cat itself without adding the net extension? Great like question. Great question. It is an obvious question. It is a great question and we have no answers for, I don't know why. Um, so there was a paper many, many years ago by Ernie Cohen and um, a subsequent paper by Annabelle McIver um, who is someone who has done extensive work on probabilistic semantics um, on a quasi-complete axiomatization of probabilistic linear algebra. Um, that work is sort of not finished and we never, somehow we did probabilistic netcat independently of that work. Um, and we only realized that work existed after we did prop netcat. And, and up to this day, I. I've thought we should go back to the drawing board and sort of clarify what would be probabilistic KA or probabilistic CAT and how that interacts with, with PropNet CAT, but we, we haven't done that. And I don't know of anyone who has done that. All right, I guess this is a good point uh, where to stop. Alex, can you um, stop sharing so that we can see maybe you better and we can uh, thank you very much from uh, all the organizer for uh, the great class uh, you gave us uh, i hope all the student uh, enjoyed it and uh, it was great to have you here uh, you have been to opls multiple time i hope uh, you will be there again in the future Thanks, Mark, and thanks for the invitation, and thanks for all the questions and all the interaction. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, I hope to see some of you live around in conferences and in other places. So, um, so thanks very much, and I'll upload things on Slack uh, a bit later today, and um, I'll try to come back come back later for um, at the end of the last lecture to um, say goodbye to um, to the organizers as well. And I, I just saw something on the chat since I stopped sharing. Concurrency is a black hole. I guess that's a great, great statement to end, to end, to end this lecture. <laughs> Concurrency is a black hole indeed. So thanks everyone and enjoy the rest, the last two lectures of OPLSS. And, um, oh, that is sweet. I get it. Hi, Dr. Silva. Well, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Yes, yes. we can hear you.
Good. Well, on behalf of all the students of OLPSS 2021, I want to present you the excellent lecture certificate because you do give us excellent lectures. Well, although oh, the, Zoom the Zoom didn't like the category theory part of the lecture and give us trouble from time to time, but we have enjoyed every minute of the lectures. Your in-depth knowledge of the cleaning algebra and the applications has led us through a journey from the basic knowledge of Clemens theorem and Brodowski derivative until the latest cutting edge research such as NetCAD and its applications. And we do have enjoy, we do enjoy all the lectures and have learned a great deal from it. And I'm confident to say um, the students are eager to apply the knowledge from your lectures and maybe you'll lead to new discoveries down the road. And we are truly, we truly appreciate to have you here. And I want to encourage everyone now to unmute their mic and also turn the camera to join me, express our gratitude towards Dr. Silva. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's very touching, touching tribute. Um, OPLSS always has these, these things and I'm, uh, I'm very touched. So thank you very much for that. Um, thank you. This is, uh, this is very touching. So thank, thanks very much. And thanks for, um, for all the interaction in my lectures. I really appreciate um, that is more difficult on Zoom and everyone has done um, a great effort to, um, to remain engaged. And, and thanks Billy for um, being my right hand throughout this uh, four, four lectures. That was, um, that was great. So thanks, thanks very much everyone. And I'll see you, I'll see you all later at the, um, at the end of the other two Two lectures. So enjoy the the rest of your um, of your day, and enjoy a bit of a break before the 